We begin with early education. Chicago benefits from a robust mixed delivery system of early care and education that allows families with young children to choose the community-based or school-based early childhood program that best suited, suits them to meet their needs. For example, community-based settings offer wraparound services and extended day programming to support working families. As mayor, how will you ensure continued expansion efforts of universal preschool upholds parents' rights to choose whether they enroll their three and four year olds in a school or community-based site? Will you commit to continuing to adequately fund community-based centers that provide early education? Absolutely. I believe that we should have universal child care for every single child in the city of Chicago. And that starts from the very beginning. You know, but the reality of it is, is that right now child care is um, unavailable, unsustainable, and unaffordable. Um, and we've seen this play out throughout the entire state, particularly after the pandemic. 58% of families throughout the state of Illinois, but especially in the city of Chicago, do not have access to affordable um, child care. And I know this from a very personal experience. You know, my, when my wife and I relied upon child care, we had a child care center in the neighborhood. At the time, we were spending $1,500 a month on child care alone. Our mortgage, $1,100. So we're spending more on child care and my student debt than our mortgage. And we are part of the working class. In fact, it's unfortunate and it's actually unconscionable that we have child care centers um, that are not fully funded and supported and the average salary of those who are providing this important service to the community is roughly four dollars an hour. And so that's why I'm very much committed to working with the state of Illinois um, to increase the funding so that we can actually implement a child care for all um, dynamic that includes not just for the public but for um, the neighborhood centers that are an intricate part of the neighborhood, right? Because Look, who better to provide child care than, than your neighbors? But we also have to make sure that we're paying child care workers a real livable wage. Many child care workers cannot afford to drop their children off and have child care services for their own families while providing services for everyone else's family. And so this is an important part of our uh, platform that not only will we have child care for all, we're going to make sure that we fully fund it. And that requires us to work in a collaborative way. And I've demonstrated as a teacher, as an organizer, as a child care um, worker. I started off $6.25 Children's World Learning Center, where you certainly learn the value of not just child care, but the trust that parents have when they drop their children off at 6 o'clock in the morning and sometimes cannot pick them up to 6 p.m. You get a chance to know people a little bit better. And so the very thing that we can do to make sure that we're supporting and funding child care for all is to make sure that we have the revenue to do it, and I'm committed to doing that. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to continue with the topic of education. Mm -hmm. Option schools are those within the CPS system that take in the most at-risk youth who have not fared well in the conventional school system. CTU in the past has tried either close the schools or tried to prevent them from opening in the first place. NCPS current posture seems to also be on the way to closing these schools, Mr. Johnson. What plan do you have in place to help option schools thrive in an environment where more than ever at-risk youth need the option schools to succeed in their education and in their lives? Well, I don't believe in school closings, and I don't ever, um, I've never worked to close a school. In fact, it's just the opposite. So I'm not quite sure where that question is coming from, quite frankly. In fact, in 2013, when the previous, previous administration proposed to shut down schools, we led walks across the entire city, black and brown folks all over the city, to push back on the school closures. Do you know there are a 1,000 children still missing from the school closings of 2013? 223 of them are my neighbors. So this is not just simply about creating options. Here's what I believe that public education at the expense of the state, after all, is a Negro idea. Those are the words of W.E.B. Du Bois. Why are we asking parents in the city of Chicago to apply for something that should be free? 
That's the problem, that we have accepted this stratified system that doesn't have to prevail. In fact, it has proven over and over again that it's a failure. Why are we picking winners and losers? I mean, unless you believe in the capitalism of public schools, which I don't know if there's anyone in this room who believes that the capital should determine the outcome of children's success. As mayor of the city of Chicago, I'm going to fully invest in all of our schools. Now, here's the reality. As someone who relies upon public schools, I'm relying on a public school system to work for my family. Do you know that my oldest son attends Kenwood Academy? And I know there's always a Bronco in the room. There's always at least one. <laughs> you know why he goes to, he attends Kenwood Academy? Because he plays the violin. And there's not a school on the west side of the city of Chicago that offers orchestra. Is that right? Why don't we have fully funded neighborhood schools where we don't have to have options? How about a fully funded system where no matter where you go, no matter where you live in the city, you have a very basic fundamental right to have access to social workers, counselors, therapists, small class sizes, arts, curriculum that is well-rounded and supported, music? How come we can't have our city be as big as the promises that we should be able to make to the city of Chicago? Mr. Johnson, let me interrupt you um, since I know we've got 30 seconds left because I want to ask, there are so many school buildings that are literally empty. What plans would you suggest that we do with all of these schools that were closed and that are now empty? What, what would you think we should do with Yeah, them? that's a very good question. So part of what I believe the effort has to be is to make sure that these buildings are a part of the public space. That's my, my preference would be. And so they could be affordable housing units. I would encourage um, our trades in particular to set up wash burns all over the city of Chicago. Could you imagine actually having empty buildings now filled with training centers for people? There's, there's real opportunity here for us to grow our economy. And that's why I can't wait to become the next mayor of the city of Chicago, to grow our economy. Thank you. Thank you. The next question deals with community development. What will your funding priorities to address the long history of the city's disinvestment in black and Latino communities, particularly how will tax increment financing, TIF funds, and other public incentives be used to promote neighborhood investment in black and Latino communities? You think you look, I mean, the TIFs, unfortunately, there's been a misuse of those TIFs, right? They have been robbed. Neighborhoods have been robbed. Our parks, our schools, so that developers can create wealthier spaces for the wealthy. Look, I believe that the Invest in Southwest operation has potential. That's why I've committed to $500 million more million every single year to make sure that we're providing real money, that our people get to participate, and it's a community process. I personally believe that the distance between the fifth floor and residents is too far apart. I'm going to close that. I believe in co-governance. But it also means that we actually have to raise new revenue, too. If we want a fully funded, um, economically viable um, operation, we have to make sure that we're not raising revenue off the backs of working people. And that's why I'm the only com candidate who's committed to not raising property taxes. Now, do I believe in the very fundamental democratic principle, as President Biden has indicated, that a teacher and a firefighter should not pay the same tax rate as a billionaire? Of course I believe that. In fact, 71% of Chicagoans, when we were fighting for a fair tax, 71% of Chicagoans agreed to have a tax structure that's equitable and fair so that we can fund the critical services like the economic development that we need. Can we circle back to the question, uh, how, will the ta how will you use TIF funds and other public incentives to promote neighborhood investment in black and Latino communities? Yeah, as I said, Dorothy, that we are going to make sure that we use the TIFs to be directed into the neighborhoods in which they were designed. I'm clear about that. Exactly. But I'm also clear, though, that that's not going to be enough. That's the point. It's not going to be enough. Now, I believe there's more than enough in this city for everyone, but we have to make sure that we're generating revenue to actually support the, the economic development that's needed. Look, you're not going to be able to manage a multi-billion dollar budget off of bake sales. Just not. And then when we think about when it comes to life and death in this city, where our economic corridors, the very places in which we can build up an economy, because the economic corridors, particularly our small businesses, are more likely to hire from our community, we have to make sure that we're investing in that. It's worth the life. The question is, how much do you believe lives, particularly black and brown, are worth? I believe they're worth everything. Thank you. 
Let's move on to economic development. The current administration implemented a guaranteed income pilot program that positively impacted black and Latino communities in Chicago. Would you support the creation of a permanent incentive, uh, permanent guaranteed income program for the city of Chicago? As a Cook County Commissioner, I was the lead sponsor of something called the Justice for Black Lives Resolution, which was an entire budget built around that very purpose, where we laid out a vision of how we can use our dollars at the county level to implement programs just like that. In fact, at the county level, we actually have the largest guaranteed income pilot program anywhere else in the entire world, where over 55% of those who are receiving that $500 check every single month are overwhelmingly black and brown women. So not only am I committed to doing it, we've already done it, we're going to expand it, and we're going to make it permanent. Thank you. You're welcome. Crime and safety. In a February 2023 survey conducted by Northwestern University Center for the Study of Diversity and Democracy and Latino and black serving organizations found that 46% of Latino voters and 54% of black voters ranked reducing crime as the most important issue that they want the next mayor to address. Beyond expanding the size of CPD, if elected, what are three things that you will do to help achieve public safety and who will you work with to implement and vet your strategy? Yeah, thank you. Let's tackle the, the back part of the question first. We have district council members for the first time in the history of the city of Chicago who are duly elected to provide infrastructure for a public safety plan. That's a good thing. I organized and fought alongside organizers all around the city to get that done. So that's who we work with. We also work with violence prevention um, organizations, the faith community. We also work with the city council. These are people who are connected to the ground and they know the intricacies of their particular neighborhoods. But we also have to be very honest and thoughtful about how we invest in violence prevention. Because a public safety plan that does not use data to prevent crime from happening, that's not a real plan, right? And so that's why not only working with the district council, not only working with violence prevention workers, community-based organization, we're going to double the amount of young people that, we're gonna, that we hire, not just for summer positions, but year-round positions. There's data that proves over and over again that youth employment, there's a direct correlation between youth employment and violence reduction. Sister agencies that I have jurisdiction over, we're hiring young people. Working with corporations who want to participate in building a better, stronger, safer Chicago, we work with those corporations as well. And we make sure that they have wraparound services because many of these young people are experiencing unprecedented levels of, of, of trauma. But here's the other thing that we have to do. We've got to be honest about the brutality that has existed in our communities for too long. Do you know how hard it is to come home to black sons and a black daughter? trying to explain how black children and brown children are being gunned down and brutalized by police? You can't explain it. You can't. Do you know we have over 100 black men who've been exonerated because they've been forced and tortured into false confessions? It's a harsh reality. You're going to have a mayor that is committed to telling people the truth and working collectively with law enforcement, with the district council members, also working alongside our faith community and violence prevention workers to come up with a plan, because we clearly don't have one, to come up with a plan to build a better, stronger, safer Chicago. Thank you. What are your plans, though, for, you mentioned hiring more young people to be police officers, but exactly what are your plans for putting more officers on the streets, and more importantly, for reducing the response time to 911 calls? All right, so that's two different questions. There's one plan about violence prevention, who you're going to work with. And now we have another question, which I appreciate the follow-up question about more officers. I've already made this commitment. It's in my public safety plan that we're going to promote and train 200 more detectives because we're not solving violence in the city of Chicago, particularly in black and brown communities. We're not solving. We have a clearance rate of, what, 17, 18, maybe 20 percent. That's a part of the plan. We can do that immediately. We've got to do that. We also have to make sure that we are implementing the consent decree. It's going to cost $50 million conservatively to do that. I'm grateful to have the support of the top legal officer in the, in the state of Illinois, the Attorney General, Kwame Raoul, of which part of the consent decree is making sure that our officers have mental health care services, too. You know, our police force is getting younger. 
Oh, okay, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, be because... All right, because, uh, I mean, yeah, somehow I, my I, plan to actually well, solve well, crime... Yeah, I mean, because there are, like, more than 1,100, I think, that... Are, that okay, that so are then that's a different so question. The question, the question. I got becomes. you. If you're asking me, uh, Ms. Tucker, of, of whether or not we're going to hire 11 more hundred cops, let me just say this. It takes two years to get police officers on the front line. Do I live in Austin. We don't have two years to wait for police officers to show so, up. So what's the answer if you don't wait? I mean, how, how do you hire I've given you the you answer. Oh, oh. You promote and train 200 more detectives. Look, here's the problem with policing in the city of Chicago. We put too much pressure on police officers. We're asking them, look, I've been a frontline worker. I'm a teacher. And I am not a social worker or a counselor. The fact that almost 40% of our 911 calls are mental health crises and you're asking law enforcement to not only be mental health crisis workers, they've got to be marriage therapists. The Los Angeles Police Department, check it, take a look, Los Angeles Times, they agree with me. They're calling for treatment, not trauma, because they said that they're not social workers. We're asking police officers to do their job and someone else's. How do you attract more police officers to become officers if the job working conditions are not palatable for them? It's just not. And, and until we're honest about that, you're going to have a tough time recruiting more people. And so it's also a problem that when you recruit police officers, black and brown individuals in particular get bumped out because they don't pass a psychological exam or they have something, you know, a misdemeanor or a bad credit score. We're not even providing a pathway for those who live in some of the most violent communities who want to sign up to protect them. We're not even giving them a pathway to do it. Okay. In the interest of time, we'll move on. Thank you for your answers. You're We're, welcome. Now I want to talk about equitable representation and appointments. According to a recent U.S. Census, the city of Chicago is approximately one-third black and one-third Latino. Do you commit to having a parity or equitable representation of black and Latinos in key leadership roles and appointed positions under your administration? What would be your plan and strategy? Yes to work with the community. Look, I'm supported by people like Delia Ramirez. She's going to make sure that we have the type of support within the Latin A community. I'm supported by people like Jonathan Jackson, Jan Chikowski, Congressman Davis. Um, it's a very diverse makeup of elected officials and community-based organizations that support my candidacy. So our plan is to make sure that we are recruiting, interviewing individuals that want to serve the city of Chicago. Um, I'm looking for resumes now, if you know anybody. But would, would you commit specifically yes. to ensure? Yes, that's the, that's the first thing that I answered. I said yes. Okay. I'm committed to that. And listen, let me be very clear. As a Cook County Commissioner, as a teacher, as an organizer, this has been my lived experience. And I understand why we have to ask the question, because we've been shut out for too long. That's why I ran for office, because we don't have the type of representation that's needed in order for us to make sure that we're building a more equitable, just society. I'm a part of that representation. And the very people who got me to this point are part of that representation. I have a multicultural, multi-generational movement that has placed a brother who was polling at 2.3 percent back in October. I'm here because of that multi-generational movement to have Asian Americans, to have black Americans, to have Latina, uh, Latin aid folks in, in, in our community. Supporting my candidacy is the essence of what the city of Chicago should be about. And I'm very much committed to that. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for one more. Yes, we do. Okay, okay great. Uh, immigration. On Tuesday, March 7th, New York City Mayor Eric Adams and his administration released a report which addresses the city's response to the asylum seeker crisis. The report highlights what the city has accomplished and includes a more formal, long-term process for resettling migrants throughout the state and in other welcoming cities across the country. As mayor of Chicago, are you committed to working with the Welcome to Illinois Coalition, state government, nonprofit providers, and advocates to develop a similar plan of action? Yes, I am. In fact, as a public school teacher, it's something I'm actually pretty good at, is putting together a plan. But it also requires us to be collaborative with that plan. It's actually pretty jacked up that, you know, we have the extreme right using human beings as a political football. It's actually quite disgusting. 
The city of Chicago under my administration will always be a sanctuary space for everyone. That's why I'm grateful to have the support of someone like Delia Ramirez, the Congresswoman. She was born at Cook County Hospital. I received services from Cook County Hospital. There's enough here for everyone, you all. Now look, there are forces that will attempt to divide our communities and pit us against one another. Not under, under, not under my administration. That black, brown, white, Asian, young, old, whoever you are, you get to be supported in this city. And especially those who are seeking asylum and refuge here in the city of Chicago. We can do both. We can make sure that we are a welcoming city for the individuals who are here. We also can make sure that, like what I've done on the county board, where I passed the Just Housing Ordinance that eliminated discrimination against those who were formerly incarcerated who were seeking housing. We can build housing. It's why I believe in bringing Chicago home, raising the revenue that's needed to make sure that we're providing support for the unhoused. The fact that we have 65,000 people plus who are unhoused in the city of Chicago, it's unconscionable. How do you call yourself a world-class city and we have 20,000 students who are unhoused? There's enough for everyone. The fifth floor is big enough for black, brown, Asian, young, old, and even with the few new rich friends that I just met over the course of two weeks. <laughs> All right, here's a follow-up to it. Oh, so what I thought I was done. No, 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 no. It's all good. It's good. All right. Will you continue to invest? Follow up to the same question. Mm. Will you continue to invest sufficient and adequate resources to support new arrivals to Chicago in areas such as legal services, housing assistance, mental health care, as well as funding for staff to carry out this work? Yeah, so thank you. That can be a little bit even more specific. And so, you know, we're going to have an office that's dedicated to doing just that, fully staffed, fully funded with organizers to make sure that we don't have a top-down approach, which that has been the prevailing form of governance in the city of Chicago for too long that doesn't work that way. Just don't. Like, I trust the community. I trust my neighbors, right? And so making sure that it's fully funded and staffed and supported with organizers, absolutely, I'm committed to that. Thank you for that follow-up question. One more follow-up, because immigration is important. We're good. Um, and, and we, yeah, I just got Paul waiting. I'm good. I can stay here for another 30 minutes. You are. <laughs> well, I think he, actually he's not scheduled for another 10. We, we got, a, we got okay. time. All we, right. we got another 10 you. minutes, so just get comfortable. Let's keep going then. So how will you address some of the tensions that have emerged on this issue, immigration, yeah. Yeah. regarding housing migrants at James Wadsworth Elementary School in the Woodlawn neighborhood? How are you going to deal with those tensions? You take them head on. You take the conversation right to the community. Look, can I just tell you something about black people? I don't ever like to speak for all black people. But universally, we don't mind sharing. We don't. Like, we grow up with play cousins. Like, well, there's a literal thing in the black community about having people who are not your biological cousin, but we still make them your cousin anyways. All we're saying is that if we're sharing the space, then it needs to be distributed in an equitable way so that no one has to lose at the expense of someone else winning. And so it's having direct conversations to let people know that there's more than enough in the city of Chicago. We can fund those who have been here and those who we are welcoming here. Whether you come from Salus, Mississippi or Central America, we got here. So let's run it, y'all. <laughs> let's run it and let's make sure that there's enough for everyone. I'm committed to that. Mr. Johnson, you mentioned housing and the unhoused just a couple yeah. of minutes ago. High-end developments, higher housing costs, and higher property taxes mm -hmm. have forced families to That's leave right. not just their community but the city as well. Mm -hmm. What specifically will your administration do to create and preserve more affordable rental housing opportunities for working families, seniors, youth, et cetera? How will your administration build general wealth through the creation of more homeownership mm -hmm. opportunities without displacing anyone who chooses to age in place mm. in their community. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, look, I've made a commitment. I'm not raising property taxes. That's thing one. I'm not doing it. That's crushing the economy. You have individuals with fixed incomes who've paid for their homes, and now they're losing their homes, something that they paid and bought. So I'm not raising property taxes. We're also going to expand the affordable housing ordinance to provide more equitable distribution of the development that goes towards affordability. And we're going to provide down payment assistance for those who are seeking to be homeowners. Well, my wife and I purchased our first home in Austin. It's our only home, by the way. I ain't moving again. The house was $150,000.
My wife and I had a combined income of $80,000 with six degrees. We were the richest people in our families, and we needed two government programs to help us have a down payment for that home. And so now there's generational wealth. 35% of Northsiders make $100,000 a year or more. Over half of families who live on the west and south side make less than $25,000 a year. The inequity that exists within the city of Chicago is deeply tied to why Dr. King showed up here in the first place. We're going to fulfill that promise to make affordable housing available. We're going to build public housing, especially public housing for seniors. We built two senior affordable housing units in my district in my first term, and we broke ground on the third one. I can't wait to become the next mayor of the city of Chicago. We're going to do that when I'm mayor. All right. Speaking of um, police, at one point, former Superintendent David Brown told Chicago police officers that they would no longer be allowed to chase people on foot because they're running away from them or committed minor offenses. Do you agree with that policy? Will you change it if you become mayor? I agree with it. I believe Adam Toledo would be alive if he wasn't chased down and gunned down and killed. I believe that. You know, look, again, this has to be about violence prevention. Safe American cities all have one thing in common. You know what it is, y'all? They invest in people. In the 1990s, when my opponent was in charge of the budget, we had more police officers at that time, and there were over 900 people being murdered every single year. It was worse with more police officers. There's not a direct correlation between law enforcement and law enforcement spending in, in safety. If that were the case, we'd be the safest city in the world. We spend more in policing per capita than anywhere else in the world. And let me ask you a question. Do you feel safe? I live in Austin. I live in one of the most violent neighborhoods in the entire city. There have been more murders in the last four years in Austin, in the last four years, than combined all of the north side communities. I'm living it every day. In fact, I might be the first mayor ever elected to live in one of the most violent neighborhoods in the country. Who better has incentive for a safer community? So I'm committed to doing what works because it's a matter of life and death. It's investing in people. You, you've mentioned uh, a lot of times your personal experience, and we've spoken a lot about uh, police department and their role in safety. Mm -hmm. But as someone who's, who has experienced, as you said, living in these communities, all, there, it's also about the disinvestment in those communities. What other resources would your administration implement in, re, in regards to providing that safety outside of policing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look, there's a great deal of vacancy in the city of Chicago. There's a lot of abandonment. Do you imagine you all with the workforce development that we can do to create real economic opportunities for our people to actually revitalize our own communities, rehab the homes, build new homes like what's happening in parts of the city like Sister Tamar who's using these um, crates from trains, those big cargo trains that they, we can just recycle and build homes from those. And not only can we revitalize and rehabilitate and rehab the homes, create work opportunities, you can put the homes back on the, on, on the tax roll by providing incentive for train operators, bus operators, child care workers to get the down payment assistance to become homeowners. You do three things. You create jobs, you create generational wealth, and you create economic stability, which is the greatest predictor of how safe a community can be. We can do all that now. And so these are the type of investments that I'm prepared to make. And yes, I'm going to ask those with means to save a life. There are businesses that we want to attract to the city of Chicago, large corporations. What I would love to see when these large corporations want to come to the city, I'm going to welcome them. And then I'm going to drive them around the city of Chicago so they can see the 65,623 people who are unhoused and say, what greater incentive do you have to invest in the city of Chicago so that people don't have to live on the streets? that we don't have to have unemployment that reflects the Great Depression era numbers when white men were unemployed at 30%. Our country called it a national crisis 
with 30% of white men unemployed. They said it was dangerous, and they literally began to give white men shovels before there were things to dig. Free education, free housing. No one called it entitlement. No one called bootstraps and strings. In the city of Chicago, we have stuff to dig, things to build, and lives to save. I can't wait to become the next mayor of the city of Chicago. Can you ask me another question? There's one dude who keeps putting up that red, and I'm going to convince him. I'm going to win him tonight. I'm going to win you, brother. <laughs> right. talking, about, um, talking about downtown and, yeah. you know, in, in corporate Chicago, yeah. we have a number of empty storefronts mm -hmm. in downtown Chicago. Mm -hmm. Um, there are companies that are just not returning because so many people are working at home now. Yep. So you're going to have empty office spaces. How will you address those concerns? How will you address those issues as mayor? So part of it, that's a good question. I've thought a lot about this a lot. You know, this is really about um, attracting um, innovative corporations to the city of Chicago, particularly around biotechnology. Um, Manufacturing, that includes digital manufacturing, which is exploding. The life sciences, logistics, right? You have entire cities being revitalized just through logistics, being able to move cargo and product from one end of the world to the other end of the world. We also have an opportunity. Here's what I would love to see. The number of working people who work downtown, you all go downtown and you see people cleaning windows, their security, uh, many of those positions, working class families, wouldn't you love to be able to see families who work downtown, live downtown? I actually believe that we can create more affordable housing units, you know, especially for black and brown people who overwhelmingly make up the service industry. So it's about attracting innovative businesses to the city of Chicago to deal with the vacancy, but we also have an opportunity to create better paying jobs while at the same time creating more affordable housing. Downtown is a neighborhood. How come the workers of downtown can't live in the neighborhood in which they work in? I think they can, and I'm going to work towards that when I become mayor of the city of Chicago. Oh, come on, man. Hey! <laughs> All right, I can't. I wish I could sit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank Johnson. You. We have come to the end of the program. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I think we get to take a little break right now. Yes, and I think there's going to be. Can I have Mr. Johnson to be asked for a question? No. <laughs> I'm that, that, I, I apologize, but we're really we're, we're very tight on time, so I'm going to I'm going to ask you not to do that. Can, 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 I don't think that's I don't think that's. Fair? I don't. Okay, Ms. Can I? Can I? Yeah, you're okay, brother. You're okay, brother. I think he's going to address it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, All right, look, so we're okay. going to have to ask the uh, we're going to ask ask the same question of Mr. Vallis. So we expect you to repeat that question, or or we can just uh, no look the, go according no, look, to the, the program. The, go the ahead, brother, Mr. Johnson. I think the the, the brother is absolutely right. Look, this is what I've said before. It it is um, it's horrific. It's gruesome what's happening to our children in the city of Chicago, and brother. That's not lost on me. And it, it pains me that we have families and parents who are burying their children. I worry about it every single day. And when I say that I'm committed to coming up with a plan together, I mean that. I'm not a dictator, you all. I'm not going to be a dictator. I'm going to work with you. I'm going to work with the people in the room to solve this. We got to do it, and we can do it. I'm confident that we can do it. My son, who's a student at Kenwood, his third week, a student leaves out for lunch and gets murdered over lunch. This is why I've said repeatedly, as much as I'm committed to hiring 200 more detectives, I've asked myself this question countless times. I wake up April 5th, and I'm just a month away from running one of the largest economies in the world, and I don't want to wake up every single day to people being murdered in the city of Chicago. Which would you rather have? 
closure to a murder or the prevention of a murder. This is why I'm focused on definitely solving crime, but we have to get at the root causes of crime. Bike rides, trick-or-treating should not end in tragedy. The bullet that came through my home, we got lucky that day. And I think about it every day. And you ain't wrong, brother, and I appreciate your humility, your vulnerability, and your bravery, brother. And I'm going to stand with you and the community to figure it out together. <laughs> All right, let's get started. We're going to start with early education. Mm -hmm. Chicago benefits from a robust mixed delivery system of early care and education that allows families with young children to choose the community-based or school-based early childhood program that is best suited to meet their needs. For example, community-based settings offer wraparound services and extended day programming to support working families. As mayor, how will you ensure continued expansion efforts of universal preschool upholds parents' rights to choose whether they enroll their three- and four-year-olds in a school or community-based site? Well, great. Well, first of all, uh, the city has really discriminated against the community-based providers. As you know, there were promises made to the providers in, in both uh, the current and the previous administrations. And the number of community-based providers have actually been reduced in number, and I've always felt that community-based providers are the best providers. So m my position is you, you really need to dramatically expand uh, universal, you need to provide universal pre-K, and it really needs to be built around a community-based provider system because it's really the best way not only to provide affordable preschool uh, pre-K or universal pre-K, but it's also the best way to really uh, uh, involve the community and really to, to transform early childhood into an economic development investment. Secondly. We have 650 schools. Those schools need to be open th through the dinner hour on weekends, over the holidays. Uh, there, there are so many schools that have extra space. There's no reason why every single elementary school can't uh, provide a, a facility so that every single community and every single school can have uh, universal early childhood services being offered at that school. I mean, a lot of times the community-based providers are just looking for facilities that they can access. So you need to allow them to use buildings. And if they have their own facilities, you need to in, in, include them in the uh, capital planning. And you need to really provide them with tax exempt status. So whether they're for-profit or not-for-profit, from a tax standpoint, they need to have property tax abatements. The third thing is you need to do universal prenatal to the classroom. 70% of brain development occurs during zero to three. I did universal prenatal for 2,500 pregnant teens. Uh, when the children reached third grade, there was no achievement gap. There was an 80% graduation rate among the parents. And um, uh, there, there were like uh, four who were in the program who became pregnant a second time. There was never more dynamic a program. I should have brought it to much scale. So when I become mayor, there will be universal preschool. It will be community-based. We will open the school campuses uh, to our uh, all the community providers, and uh, we will focus on prenatal to the classroom. Uh, I think I know the answer to this one, but it sounds like that you will make a commitment to adequately fund community-based centers that provide early education. Yes, absolutely. And there's no reason when you consider that the school system is spending $30,000 a child, and if the, if the money is really pushed down to the local schools and to the local communities, because I believe schools should be community schools, that and the additional money that's been made available through the Biden administration, as well as additional funding through the schools, there's no reason why you can't provide universal, and you can't do, and there's no reason you can't do prenatal to three, too. Thank you. Seeing on education, option schools are, are those within the CPS system that take the most at-risk youth who have not fared well in the conventional school system. CTU in the past has tried either to close the schools or prevented them from opening in the first place. And CPS's current posture seems to also be on the way, uh, on the way to closing these schools. Mr. Vallis, what plan do you have to play to, in place to help option schools thrive in an environment where more than ever at-risk youth need option schools to succeed in their education and in their lives. Well, let me point out that when I was CEO of the Chicago Public Schools, and, and you know, it, it's been a tough campaign because so much misinformation is put out, uh, our enrollment grew by 40,000, and we were a strong supporter of option schools. But what we also did was we expanded options. For example, if anyone knows Jack Wiest in the Alternative Schools Coalition, I brought those, at the time, 22 community schools into a single charter. Now, so you know, I only opened 15 charter schools, not the 120 that were open after my departure. 
and most of those schools were like option schools. And the alternative schools network was formed so that I could get them funding. And I think they've graduated 22,000 students. And those were students who, some who had been expelled, some who were overage underachieving and they could not return to the neighborhood school, some who had been incarcerated. And you can talk to Jack or you can Google, they graduate about 1,200 a year. So I'm, I'm a strong supporter of, of expanding option schools and alternative schools. And there's funding for it. The state actually provides money for the creation and funding of adult high schools. There are like, what, 50, 60,000 young people, 16 to 25, who are either not in school or they don't have jobs. And how do we reclaim them? How do we get them back into the system? So the state will actually fund adult high schools, and the state will allow school districts to actually create charter schools for alternative educational services, not to displace existing public schools. And, and those are on the books, so there's the ability to do that. So all I'm saying is there is the funding there to create option schools, to support option schools, and there is the funding to create more alternative educational placement. We've lost uh, uh, 25,000 young people since 2019, 11% enrollment decline, mostly high school kids, gone on the street. Uh, how are we gonna reclaim them? How are we gonna get them back in? Option schools afford the district an opportunity to do that. The funding is there, God knows the buildings are there. I mean, we could transform some of those buildings that are vacant or underpopulated. We could put option schools in those buildings if the community is willing to uh, allow that. You know, I, that is one of the questions I was going to ask about all those empty buildings. Uh, in addition to suggesting what you're talking about, putting other schools in there, what are some other ideas that as mayor you would do with those empty buildings that are literally sitting in communities mm -hmm. and, and some of them are quite frankly eyesores in that community? Well, let me point out, and if you Google my website, I post, and, it, and you can plug in your address. You plug in the address and I'll show you a school building I built uh, when I was CEO. Seventy eight school buildings were built during my tenure, 78, the majority of them on the south and west sides. All the prefab schools were torn down like Dupriest and replaced uh, with those schools. And that included schools like Brownsville Military Academy, the new Simeon, the, the new Westinghouse, uh, 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 the Gwendolyn Brooks in Rosen where I grew up, right across the street. So the bottom line is uh, school enrollment was, was growing. <clears throat> I think these schools, these underutilized schools, the schools uh, that have 5 10% enrollment, as well as schools that have been closed, uh, they can be, uh, first of all, the schools can house alternative education programs. Like I said, there's a massive population of young adults who have left the school system who need to be reclaimed. They don't have the skills to get, they don't have the academic credentials to get into uh, uh, the uh, uh, city colleges, and they don't have the occupational training to get jobs. So uh, expanding the alternative schools network and allowing them to share existing underutilized buildings is one thing. And the second thing is you can do, uh, you can like the Wadsworth School, and look, they spent $5 million in the Wadsworth School to retrofit that school to handle uh, you know, immigrants who were coming in. I mean, you could spend money to renovate those other schools that have been shuttered now for years and you can turn them over to the community and you can empower the community to decide how those schools can best be used, whether it's alternative schools, adult ed occupational training uh, programs that they would want to bring to those schools. There's a myriad of services that the communities need empower the community to decide what to do with those buildings. So in some cases you're talking about actually reopening those buildings and making them alternative schools? Well, in some cases I'm saying allow the community, give the community money to renovate those buildings because some of them have been closed for so long. I mean, some of them can't be reopened. But give the community the money to renovate those buildings and then to determine what their needs are. Do they need an alternative school? Do they want a school Where's that money adult? come from? Do they need, pardon me? Where does that money come from? Well, you know, first of all, there, there is money uh, to fund alternative schools through the school aid formula. The state actually will fund alternative schools. The state actually authorizes you to create like adult high schools and to include that enrollment in the school funding formula. Plus for young adults, there's federal programs. There's workforce development programs that provide grants for training, occupational training. There's also incentives uh, uh, the, that are given to businesses that hire individuals who fall into the at-risk categories like uh, returning citizens. R right now, one of the biggest problems we face in the community is returning citizens, individuals returning from incarceration who have no occupational training skills. So those, so those schools can be used to address a number of community needs. Right. Let the community decide. Thank you. Thank you for that question. We're going to move on now to community development, speaking okay. of community. What will, what will be your funding priorities to address the long history of the city's disinvestment in black and Latino communities. 
particularly how the tax increment financing, TIF funds, and other public incentives will be used to promote in neighborhood investment in black and Latino communities. And, and that's a two and a half minute response? <laughs> no, 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 I'm wondering, I just want to make sure I'm on time. Okay. I have a tendency not They're to shorten my remarks. Minutes. I have a tendency to talk <laughs> faster. Sorry about that. Look, you know, I, th I think what we have to do with the Mayor's e Southwest Initiative institutionalize and expand it. This is how you do it. I believe that you need to create an independent economic development authority that will f focus exclusively on South and West Side developments. And you need to have a deputy mayor that is responsible for that so they can cut through the red tape, the aldermanic privilege, and they can focus exclusively, take politics out of it. Secondly, you need to have fair share. And I wrote about this four years ago. So I've been talking about this for four years. And under fair share, you earmark a portion of the TIF monies, the TIF surpluses, you put the casino, a portion of the casino money, the gaming money, the video poker money, the developer fee money into a fund, and that fund is available to the development authority. So now when you're investing in communities, whether it's housing, whether it's uh, developing commercial properties, or for that matter, whether it's restoring community-based social services like mental health services, et cetera, there is a capital fund, there is a capital fund like a, a bank uh, uh, Jamal refers to it as a community bank. I refer to it as a community investment fund, but it's the same thing. So you have the access. The third thing you need to do is you need to secure and claim all that property that's sitting idle. Sometimes people just hoard the property and they let it uh, be undeveloped, whether it's housing, whether it's uh, vacant lots, whether it's the U.S. Steel site. You secure it, you remediate that site, you turn it over to community-based organizations. Community-based organizations, you give it to them with the power to award 10-year property tax abatements. So now you have a development authority. Now you have capital investments. Now you have land, tax-free land. That will spur development. And then the fourth thing you do is you take the city's budget and you prioritize providing contracts to black and Latino businesses. When I spent $3.2 billion with Gary Chico on the Chicago Public Schools, 55% of those contracts went to black and Latino businesses, including 32% to black male-owned businesses, and 58% of those hired were black and Latino. Well, imagine applying that model to the $28 billion that the city controls. So I'm talking about a development authority. I'm talking about the fair share of revenues, TIF revenues. I'm talking about access to property. I mean, how many times does the community, is the community unable to access that, those vacant properties with tax incentives? And then prioritizing when it comes to allocating city contracts or purchasing from vendors, et cetera, prioritizing those fledging businesses in the community so they can be a part of it. I wrote about this you four years ago. I talk about it now. Yeah, I was trying to do it before your little pink card came up. Uh, the Independent Community Development Authority, you've, you've mentioned this before. Mm -hmm. um, what authority will that agency have over the aldermen? I mean, it, when it comes to a case of who's in charge now and, 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 and also when it comes to this new agency that you're talking about and staffing that agency, how much would that cost? In well, you know, first of all, the independent, right now the problem at City Hall, whether you're a fledging business on the south and west side or for that matter a thriving business is the bureaucracy, planning, zoning, all the manner of privilege, uh, uh, Department of Buildings, Department of Housing, the Department of Revenue, they're strangling businesses. They're strangling, talk to small businesses, talk to the larger businesses. I, I mean, look at the mayor's clearly visionary Southwest initiative. Biggest problem is not being able to get the projects out of the way because it takes months and months and months. So if you create an economic development authority that's basically overseen by a board that's drawn from the community, and, and this is my idea. Actually, Alderman Beal and others have talked to me about this idea for a number of years that can drive through the red type and can focus on South and West Side. And then you give them access to a fair share this, the city has declared a billion dollars in TIF revenues the last three years. Why couldn't a third of that money or, or, or a fourth of that money have been dedicated to the south and west sides? Thank I mean, you. Why, can't we, why can't we do fair share, whether it's casino money or gaming money or video poker money or sports betting money? Why can't that money be dedicated to that fund? So I'm talking about not only how organizing so you can move it forward, how providing access to property tax-free property so you can move forward, but I'm also talking about responding to your question about fair share, the fair share of TIF monies that divert $1.1 $1 billion in your property taxes a year to development Ballas, that you have no control over. Mr. Ballas, yes, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> we pivoted. Yes. Go ahead. 
Finish. No, no, no. I was going to no, say, Mom. He's done. No, no. I'm good. Sorry about that. We pivoted uh, somewhat uh, in economic development, and the current administration implemented a guaranteed income pilot program that positively impacted black and Latino communities in Chicago. Mr. Ballas, would you support the creation of a permanent incentive, uh, a permanent guaranteed income program for the city of Chicago? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I support income support, but it doesn't, it can come in a variety of ways. It can come in capping people's property taxes. It can come in providing property tax relief grants. Uh, it, can be, it can come in other indirect forms of, of, uh, of assistance. You know, the so-called income support program has served 5% of those who applied. You know, so yeah, it's, a, it's great, it's a nice headline, and people talk about the program, but it was like a one-year-off or two-year-off program that didn't serve 90% of the people who applied for it. So you've got to look at multiplicity, uh, 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 you've got to look at multiple ways of providing people with income support. Sometimes it's providing them with affordable housing. Sometimes it's capping their property taxes. Look what's happening in areas where there's over gentrification. You have families on fixed income that are being driven from their homes because their property taxes are growing by 30 or 40%. So you've got to look at the problems comprehensively. You know, so, so, you know, these one-off programs like that that don't serve 90, 95% of the people who applied, I mean, they make political points, but at the end of the day, what do they accomplish? So I'm open to looking at comprehensive ways to support uh, families, working families, the working poor, returning citizens, and, and, and you know, one, there may not be one single solution, but a number of things that you can do to address that issue. So, again, you, you've mentioned a couple of ideas, but you're open to yes. creating ideas. But as far as something concrete that you can, your administration can roll out in, in, the, in your first year in office if elected mayor, is there anything that you can share with us? Yeah, sure. As, well, a, the first as, a, thing, as, a, as a roadmap to achieving that goal. Yeah, well, you know, the first thing that I want to do is, is expand affordable housing. And the way I'm going to do that is by removing obstacles to, uh, uh, you know, people who have multi multifamily uh, uh, buildings to convert unimproved space to garden units. Those units are always, all, almost, all, almost always affordable. The second is by actually earmarking uh, a substantial amount of the tax increment financing revenues to promote affordable housing, you know, to, uh, you know, to provide the type of subsidized housing that communities need in the communities where the affordable housing is needed. The third thing that I talked about doing is taking the 15,000 uh, 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 residential units that are currently unoccupied and sitting there and, and seizing them and securing them through eminent domain and turning them over to community-based organizations with, with the uh, f facility improvement grants and allowing them to determine how they are best needed in the community. And the fourth thing I think I've, as I mentioned, and I might be getting redundant and I apologize for that, is, is obviously finding a way to, to cap local property taxes. So gentrification is dry, not driving you out. I want to mention one final point is you've got to get the CHA in the affordable housing game. There's like 7,000 vacant CHA units that are unoccupied, and yet we have a housing Thank crisis. you. Thank you. Okay. Crime and safety. In a February 2023 survey conducted by Northwestern University's Center for the Study of Diversity and Democracy, and Latino and black serving organizations found that 46% of Latino voters and 54% of black voters ranked reducing crime as the most important issue that they want the next mayor to address. Beyond expanding the size of CPD, if elected, what are three things that you will do to help achieve public safety and who will you work with to implement and vet your strategy? Well, you know, let me uh, point out that I, I haven't talked about expanding CPD. I've been talking about filling the vacancies because they're spending uh, the money that they save from not filling the vacancies, they're spending in overtime. So you've got to fill the vacancies, and then you have to push the officers down to the local police beats. Right now, only 53% of the officers on the force are, are actually under the command of the districts. So you wonder why 406,000 high-priority 911 calls did not have a car available, 32,000 assaults in progress, or 150,000 domestic violence calls 10% responded to in a timely manner. The bottom line is you need local beat cops. You need beat integrity. So if there's a call, it's coming in minutes, and the police officer that's responding knows the community, and they are known by the community instead of being like, moved around all over the city. So you've got to return, and you've got to get rid of the privatized security on the CTA 
And you've got to hire police officers to ride the trains and to be on the platforms and be at the stations. 50, 50%, almost 50% of those polled by WBZ said that they are afraid to take the CTA. The CTA fare box is 18% of the operating budget, which means when the COVID money runs out, the CTA could cease to function. And no one's even talking about that. Plus, there's 500,000 fewer riders a day. You know why? Because people are afraid to take the CTA. Because we have unarmed security that do nothing and sometimes run away when there's a conflict. So we've got to return to the concept. We've got to fill the vacancies, which is what I've talked about doing. Uh, and there's hundreds of police officers that I know will return from retirement if there's new leadership at the police department, et cetera. And what we've got to do is we've got to return to the concept of beat integrity, where every police beat has a police, have, have police officers assigned to it who are known to the community and who know the community, and we've got to make sure that riding the CTA is as safe as going to the airport. And those are basically things that I've talked about doing. There's another part to the question um, that I'm not sure you answered in. Okay. That is, who will you work with to implement and to vet your strategy? Well, you, you know, I'll work with the city council and the community-based organizations. You know, when I ran the Chicago Public Schools, Father Flager and I and, and others started the initial anti-violence programs and, and the marches and the, and the uh, uh, you know, uh, we contracted out with community-based organizations to do violence intervention and things like that. And, it, you know, it became something that we did in 1995. So we, close, we worked very closely with local leaders and community-based organizations. We also have an opportunity now to work with the uh, civilian elected uh, councils, the local police councils in every district. There's no reason why they can't have some input working with the police department, with the local police commanders, determining which organizations in those communities are the best ones to partner with. So you can work with them. And then, of course, the city council. I mean, when I, when I was city budget director, there was not a budget that I passed that, uh, I think one of my budgets had a dissenting vote. And that's when the Harold Washington block was still vocal, but yet I had almost overwhelming support from my budgets because I had a great relationship with the city council. And as you know, a, number, a growing number of aldermen who have now supported me. So working with the city council, working with the locally elected police councils, and obviously working very closely with the community-based organizations, Thank like you. the faith-based organizations. Thank what you. They do. You've mentioned policing uh, uh, as, a, as an answer to reducing crime. Is that the only answer to reducing crime? No, I, I, you, know, I, you know, I think I preface my remarks that you've got to get at the underlying causes of crime. Uh, first of all, I'll tell you some things you can do almost immediately. And this, is this a two-and-a-half-minute answer I can give you on this? Yeah, it's a follow-up. Great, story. great. So, so uh, for example, why are the schools closed in the evening? Why are they closed on weekends? Why are they closed during the holidays? Why are they closed over the summer? Gwendolyn Brooks, I, I built. Where are the kids going to go when they have days off? What, Michigan Avenue? There's nothing on Michigan Avenue for them. So the schools need to become community schools where the money is pushed down to the local schools, local elected school boards, and the principal to decide how that money is best, and best, uh, best uh, uh, provided. And then you have to open the community schools so you can, in effect, have uh, hundreds of thousands of young people in school, in safe and secure places, receiving the supports that they need, extended day, extended year, all through the summer. The second thing you need to do is you need to have a strategy for returning citizens because you have tens and t uh, of thousands of individuals returning from incarceration who can't get housing, who can't get jobs, and are blocked from getting hired by the city or, that matter, city contractors. So I've articulated plans to address both issues as well as how to get at the long-term underlying causes of disinvestment in the community, which I talked about, my, my investment authority, my, my fair share fund, and, and my land banking, which Thank I talked you, about Ms. earlier. Thank you, Thank uh, you. In the interest of time, we're going to move on. Okay. The next subject we want to talk to you about is equitable representation in appointments. According to the recent U.S. Census, the city of Chicago is approximately one-third black and one-third Latino. Do you commit tonight to having parity or equitable rep representation of black and Latinos in key leadership roles of your administration, appointed positions? What would be your plan and strategy to implement that? Well, you know, the answer is yes, but I like to think that I actually had more representation if you were setting goals based on population. So, for example, uh, the vast majority of principals that I promoted and assistant principals who were promoted during my watch were black and Latino. 
And in fact, 76 of our principals and assistant principals were Latino. There were very few Latino principals in the school system. Compare the numbers we had when Chico and I were at the board with the numbers they have now. It's abysmal. In addition, at the, at the administrative positions, the overwhelming vast majority of my staff were black and Latino. Every single one of my chief academic officers in four different cities have been black. And all of them women save one. All of my chief of staff save one. And I've had seven in four different school districts over the years have been black, uh, with the one exception. Uh, Rain Martin, who was at the Chicago Housing Authority, helped me in New Orleans. And, it, and if you look throughout my administration, it's been dominated by both blacks and Latinos. In fact, there are over 30 superintendents who at one time or another worked for me. Some don't claim that they worked for me, or some I don't claim that worked for me either, including one U.S. Education Secretary, Arnie Duncan, and the majority of them were black and Latino, and the majority of them were women. That's just a fact. So why did I do it? Was I concentrating on quota? No, I promoted talent. When I saw talent, I promoted it. I put talent in leadership positions. That's what I've done in every place that I've gone, and it's always been talent that I've promoted from within. That's just a fact. That is just an absolute fact. So, you know, I don't have to set goals. I'll exceed those goals, just as I did on, like I did on minority and women-owned business contracting. Okay. Thank you. On Tuesday, March 7th, immigration is this title, New York City Mayor Eric Adams and his administration released a report which addresses the city's response to the asylum seeker crisis. The report highlights what the city has accomplished and includes a more formal, long-term process for resettling migrants throughout the state and in other welcoming cities across the country. You may know that the Latino Policy Forum convenes the Welcome to Illinois Coalition, a table that brings together many of the organizations, including representatives from the city of Chicago and the state, to share information and resource on the crisis. As mayor of Chicago, are you committed to working with the Welcome to Illinois Coalition, state government, nonprofit providers, and advocates to develop a similar plan of action? More specifically, will you continue to invest sufficient and adequate resources to support new arrivals to Chicago in areas such as legal services, housing assistance, mental health care, as well as funding for staff to carry out this work? The answer, quite simply, is a resounding yes. But, but let me point out that uh, uh, in the 90s, when Chico and I were at the schools, we were a welcoming school district for, for people who were coming to this country. And, we had a whole series of, of uh, ways of immigrants during the Balkan Wars, or war in the Balkans, there were Bosnians, I mean, huge infusion. And, and, and so, the, so what we did was we worked within the existing infrastructure. People would come in, we'd provide them with the same services, whether they were citizens or not citizens. We would connect them uh, with uh, housing advocates. We would provide them uh, with additional uh, supplemental health care services. To, at the time, the, you know, the uh, departments were very receptive. So we, we, we basically took advantage of the existing infrastructure. Now, clearly, things have uh, – the challenges are much greater. But the bottom line is, yes, I will work with the organ – you've done a lot of the work. Guide me. Tell me what I need to sustain your efforts and to expand your efforts. But I will require that every single one of the 77 communities in Chicago be welcoming communities. Uh, and, and, and it's important that we not create the vision by simply going in and making decisions that impact individual communities without any prior consultation. So we have 77 communities. Why can't they all be welcoming communities? So, so yes, I will work with you. I will be guided by you because uh, so many of you have, have dedicated your, your lives to this, and, and you know a heck of a lot more about it than me. But I will make sure that all 77 communities are welcoming. And, and uh, I will make sure that when, when individuals come to the city, they will be afforded the, t the services uh, as if they were residents of the city. I think it's the very least. As a grandson of Greek-American immigrants, uh, it, it's, the very, it's, it, it's, the, it's the right thing to do. It's, the, it, it's a people should have a human right to be entitled to those services. Follow up to that. Mm -hmm. How will you address some of the tensions that have emerged on this issue regarding housing migrants at James Wadsworth Elementary School 
in the Woodlawn neighborhood? Well, you know, first of all, by having a conversation with the community in the first place. I mean, let's face it. And by having a strategy in which all 77 communities identify available housing, whether it's housing that, uh, that the city needs to secure through them in a domain, or whether it's housing the city needs to purchase, or whether it's temporary housing the city needs to create. There's, every community should have the ability to welcome uh, uh, people who are coming to the city. And, 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 you know, so I think if you network with the community and, and, and you develop a strategy where you expect all communities to, in, in effect, be able to identify, to identify a places that can provide for the ba I look at the CHA. I mean, they've got, uh, you know. Mr. Vallis? Yeah. Can, can we go back to the question? Because it was about the tensions. Uh, that yeah. emerged yeah. as a result of yeah. that, and, um, because people in the community, right. quite frankly, felt blindsided. Right. And uh, so, how, how how do you address the the, the tensions that arose? Well, there? you well you address it as I pointed out by basically not simply unilaterally making the decision and informing the community afterwards. Also, I've said when I went out to that community because I've had community forums that now we have this building for which they're, they've made five million dollars in investments. Of course, that building was sitting there rotting, and now they spent $5 million. Well, you need to let the community know, and this was a two-year commitment to use that building for that purpose, that it's important that uh, when that, when that uh, period is over, that that building is turned over to the community, and you let that completely renovated school uh, uh, be available so that the community decide to, uh, can decide what the future use of that school would be. So I, I think that's the reasonable. So I think, first of all, you've got to talk to communities before you impose things on them. I think I've been clear on that. And secondly, uh, if you tell the community, if you let the community know that this building is going to be available to the community uh, when that two-year period, because I think the mayor basically said the building is going to be used for a two-year period, if that completely renovated building is now going to be available to the community for whatever purpose they decide, I think that can ease the tension. Thank you. Let's continue the conversation about housing. High-end developments, higher housing costs, and now higher property taxes have forced families to just leave uh, their community, uh, but the city as well. What specifically will your administration do to create and preserve more affordable rental housing opportunities for working families, seniors, youth, et cetera? How will your administration build general wealth through the creation of more home ownership opportunities without displacing anyone who chooses to age in place in their community. Well, you know, and I've touched on this with my earlier uh, conversations about creating this community investment fund where you're taking a, a share of tax increment financing revenues every year and it's going into that fund and that fund can be used to, to help subsidize affordable housing because very little of the tax increment financing money goes to support affordable housing. So there's no reason why you can't dedicate. You can't dedicate money uh, to create affordable housing in communities through the fair share of just not TIF revenues, but casino, gaming, video poker, money that needs to be invested in the community. And I think that's one way to do it. Second is, as I've mentioned, by removing obstacles to the conversion of, of uh, uh, unimproved space to things like garden units. You could probably create well over 100,000 units if you simply remove the obstacles. So, uh, so there's so many opportunities. The third thing, as I've mentioned, is there's at, there's at least, I think, 15,000 vacant residential buildings out there, some multifamily, that are sit, sitting there. People hold, they're in tax court, they've been, they're, they're unoccupied like the schools. The city using its power of eminent domain to secure those buildings and to turn them over to community providers. I mean, there's a lot of communities that need domestic violence shelters. To, uh, to house individuals who are the victims of domestic violence. And then the fourth thing I, I think you have to do is you've got to cap individual property taxes because the problem with these citywide tax levies is they don't help communities that are undergoing gentrification that are experiencing rising property values. So you've got to cap the individual property taxes that are driving people out of their homes and driving businesses into bankruptcy. So those are things that I've talked about really for the better part of four years and I've talked about at these forums. I think those things, those things will go a long way towards not only expanding the pull of affordable housing, but not driving people out of their homes. You know, you know the thing that drives rents up is dramatic increases in property taxes. You know, you know we can try to control rent, but if, unless you control property taxes, what's happening is the individuals who control the buildings are just not going to invest in the buildings and those buildings are going to deteriorate. So you've got to cap individual property taxes 
to protect communities that are experiencing gentrification. Thank, Thank you. you. At one point, back to crime uh, policing, at one point, former Superintendent David Brown told Chicago police officers that they would no longer be allowed to chase people on foot because they're running away from them or they, they have committed minor offenses. Do you agree with this policy, and will you change it if you become mayor? No, actually what David Brown did was he laid out <laughs> elaborate rules for chasing. Not only elaborate rules that triggered chasing, but also elaborate rules that triggered the end of chasing. So the bottom line is that's what he did. So they can still chase, but they have to go through like an encyclopedia of checklists to determine when to chase and when not to chase. Yeah, and I'm just, I'm just, uh, look, I mean, I, you know, my sons are police officers. The bottom line is I've, I've been working with police officers and firefighters and other first responders. So, so you can chase, you can chase, but there are rules that need to be followed. I basically said that the rules need to be understandable and simple. If you're going to hold people accountable, you need to make sure that the rules that they're being held accountable for are simple and standardized. But let me point out that there's been a 76% reduction in, in arrests, despite the fact that there's been a dramatic increase in crime since 2019. And right now, besides the fact that they've only cleared one in six murders, they, they're only making arrests in 5% of the shootings and 2.5% of the car thefts. And we, you can go on and on with a single digit. Part of the problem is the absence of police officers on the beat to respond to complaints when you call them. Sometimes you have to wait two to three hours to get a, a response. And also part of the problem is that the police feel that the rules are so complicated they simply will not pursue anyone. So, uh, so I believe that you need to have standards, clear standards, that need to govern everything from pursuit to, uh, to uh, uh, how you investigate c crimes, how you interact with witnesses, how you enforce wardens and, uh, warrants, and, and, and those standards need to be clear and you need to have consistent, redundant training on those standards. And that's where they're falling short in the consent decree. The biggest criticism of the consent decree is they have these professional development standards and they are not meeting it. The training is falling far short. So when it comes to pursuits, what should the policy be? Well, well the policy should be you have standards that govern pursuits. What should so the which they have be? now. Uh, you know, you know, I'm not Brown and I'm not a police expert. I can't tell you when to pursue or not to pursue it, other than to say that there needs to be strict guidelines governing when police officers should pursue and when those pursuits should end. That's what I'm saying. What those standards should be is they should be simplified, simple enough, and the police need to be constantly trained on what those standards are so they become second nature. If they become second nature, I think that's what I'm saying. So right now, they have a pursuit policy. I'm just simply saying it needs to be simple enough for them to understand uh, because the more complicated it is, the more dangerous it becomes. And you okay. need to train people so they know what the policy is and yeah. they're not training them. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. We've talked about gentrification earlier in the evening. For a variety of reasons, the city of Chicago has seen an exodus of Latinos and even a, at a higher number of black residents. Would you make an effort to keep and attract more black and Latino individuals and families? And what are your plans to make the city a more welcoming and inclusive city for black and Latino communities? Well, you know, when you look at the WBZ surveys that show that the city at one time was 50% middle income when I graduated from high school. I'm not going to tell you how many years ago. Uh, and, and the uh, percentage of city of, of, of middle income uh, uh, residents today, which I think pre-COVID was 15 or 16 percent, is probably even less. Uh, uh, and when you look at the data that shows the last 20 years, the biggest exodus has been ma black middle class families with school aged children. There are two reasons for that exodus, primarily two reasons for that exodus. One is crime and one is the absence of quality uh, schools. And that's what's driving many people who have the means to relocate uh, out of the city. That's what's driving many people out. So you clearly need to have a public safety strategy that ensures that all communities are safe and secure. And it's just not more police. I've talked about the need to open school campuses, et cetera. I've talked about the need to address the issue of returning citizens. It needs to be comprehensive, but clearly public safety is, is a major issue. I've also seen it in the consent decree surveys and the polls that have been done in every community, as you pointed out. And, and the second thing I think you need to do is you need to return 
schools to the control of the community so that the and you need the money needs to follow the uh, the children into the classroom only 60 percent of the thirty thousand dollars per child that is spent in the chicago public schools and 60 percent of your property taxes go to chicago public schools finds its way into the classroom so what's happening is the schools ask a teacher if they feel they're getting thirty thousand dollars a student i mean that it's just not happening so You've got to restore the concept, like Dr. Carlos Escortia, the community schools model, where your schools are offering programs that the community wants, where those campuses are being utilized uh, uh, for the community, to the benefit of the community, whether it's uh, our early childhood, at universal early childhood education, to where, where it's work study, where it's after school tutoring and mentoring, or recreational programs. So I believe that uh, clearly having a public safety strategy that provides the support that all communities need, and that includes rebuilding in many communities the social service infrastructure, like reopening the mental health centers and opening opioid and drug addiction centers. I lost my youngest son to long, the long-term impacts on drug addiction, so we've been personally impacted by that. Uh, or, you know, uh, or for that matter, uh, or for that matter, uh, networking uh, through the through the local police councils uh, with with organizations that can provide crisis intervention, that can do conflict resolution. Thank Those you. are all things that will make the community safer. Thank you, Mr. Vance. Okay. In fact, um, we have come to the end of the program. Oh, thank Mr. you. Mr. Vance, thank you. Thank you Sorry, again thank you so for much. your time. We appreciate you. it.